Please be seated. The Hebrew Bible reading today comes from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 4 and 11 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of, a mo of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it, observe it as a perpetual ordinance. And the gospel reading tonight comes from John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, and 31b to 35. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in this world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to be betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he had put on his robe and he returned to the table and he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love for, have love for one another. Thanks be to God for the blessing of hearing his word. Preacher tonight because I would cry. So we're not going to do that tonight. But I know you're all praying for me in your seat. At least I hope you are. Maybe you're praying for yourself that the sermon might be too long since I haven't preached in a while. There are some honest people here laughing tonight. There's a man named Zig Ziglar. I 
who became acquainted with him through the grief share videos didn't know who he was but he is the person who wrote this story that I have told so many times now and Sam who preached for me while I was gone said you're not going to read that old thing tonight are you I said yes I am so bear with me if you've heard it before just roll your eyes it's a groaner a new bride had the task of making Easter dinner and her husband was helping her in the kitchen he doubted her cooking abilities and they were having ham and so she got the ham out of the refrigerator as she was getting ready to put it in the oven and cut two inches off both ends put it in the pan put it in the oven and her husband said to her what are you doing and she said making the ham he said why did you cut two inches off each end she said that's the way my mother taught me how to do it he said that's ridiculous it's wasteful why would you do that she said that's how you make a ham don't you know anything so his mother-in-law arrived for dinner and he said to her, I could ask you, why do you cut the two inches off the ham? And she said, that's how my mother taught me to do it. That's how we do it in this family, boy. And his wife looked at him like, you better be quiet there, son. So then later, he couldn't take it anymore. When Granny showed up for dinner, his mother-in-law's mother, he said to her, I have to know, why do you all cut the end off the ham? He said, it's so wasteful. We've got four inches of ham just in the refrigerator. And she said, I don't know why y'all cut it off. I did it because it wouldn't fit in my pan. You've heard that before, I'm sure. Getting ready for dinner is a big deal, isn't it? My husband and I had a mixed marriage. He was a Southern Baptist boy who married a, from Southern West Virginia, who married a Yankee, as he called me, who was an ordained United Methodist clergywoman. He came to our first Thanksgiving dinner. He said, I only have two questions. Why on earth is there sauerkraut? If you're not from this area, you probably wonder that as well. I said, Pennsylvania, Dutch, Maryland, the Eastern Panhandle, West Virginia. Anyway, we all have sauerkraut with turkey. The second question I could answer easily. He said, where's the ham? I said, Easter. Ham at Thanksgiving. You always have ham and turkey in southern West Virginia. Don't you know that? Nope. Now, I'm not going to ask this as a rhetorical question. Well, how do you get ready for a special meal for Thanksgiving or Easter dinner? What do you say? It wouldn't be Thanksgiving if we didn't have what? Turkey. What else? Relatives. Okay. Yeah, with a little cranberry sauce on the side. No, just kidding. Um, what else? It wouldn't be Thanksgiving or Easter without what? Gravy. Baked mac and cheese. I'm going to your house next year sauerkraut. Amen. I'm glad no one said pumpkin pie because I don't like pumpkin pie, but some people think it's not Thanksgiving without this or that or the other. How do you get ready for a special meal? What, do you, what are the things that you do at your home that you don't do other times of the year? Some of you might say clean up. That would be my answer. Pretend you live like this all the time. What else do you do to get ready for a special meal? Plan your menu. Shop for food. Invite the what? Invite the family. Give the dogs a bath. Okay. Everybody has traditions that they do. Um, now, the Passover. We got to see how they were taught to prepare for the Passover. Get a lamb, and if you can't afford a lamb, share a lamb with your neighbors, which is a lot of the Old Testament. Share with others what you don't have to stretch it out. Um, and last week, I watched Bill Brown. He talked about how Jesus had the disciples prepare for the Passover. What was he talking about with that? Do, 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 do. Oh, come on. I watched it on the video. You were here live. I saw some of you on the video. He sent the men ahead to untie the donkey and say, The Lord has need of it. Ah, yeah, we heard that one. Yeah. And has anyone here been to a Seder meal, a Jewish Passover meal? It's a lovely experience. If you ever had the chance to do it with the family, do it, because it's, that's their Thanksgiving dinner rolled into one. Isn't it? It's a wonderful time of celebration. There's a special place set for who? Not for Jesus, Elijah, who was swept up in the chariot. You know, swing low, sweet chariot. He was swept away, and they think he's going to come back as the precursor to the Messiah. There's a very special place set for him. If you go in, there's a fancy place. Don't sit at it. You get yourself into some hot cultural water there. But I don't know if Jesus 
did what a satyr does now. I don't know if when he was the youngest boy in the room, he got to say, well, how is this night different from all other nights? But the youngest child asks that question now. There's tradition, there's experience, there's shared history. When Jews sit at the Passover table, they believe that they are sitting with Moses and the earliest Hebrew slaves in Egypt getting ready to leave captivity and go into freedom. So there's a lot of preparation for that meal. So we read tonight John's account of Jesus' Last Supper. What's very different about this one? It's not the Last Supper that we understand to be Holy Communion, is it? He doesn't say, take and eat, this is my body, this is my blood given for you. We read that in the words tonight from Corinthians. Those were Paul's words. Whenever we share in the body and blood of Christ, we proclaim his death until he comes again. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That's what we proclaim every time we celebrate this holy meal. So how did Jesus prepare them for this particular meal? What did he do in the middle of the meal? Not before, but in the middle. While they were eating, he did what? He washed their feet. Foot washing appears in the Old and New Testaments. It's a sign of different things. It's a sign of hospitality. And it's a sign of welcome. When you went into someone's house, if you wore sandals, you would take your sandals off and someone would wash your feet because they'd be dusty and dirty from the stuff in the road, which was everything you could imagine was thrown into the road in those days. And according to John Christopher Thomas, who's a theologian, um, foot washing generally precedes a meal or a banquet. And the Old Testament particularly, foot washing was almost always the job of a slave or a servant. And he said, not only do servants draw the water, wash the feet, dispose of the water, but it appears that a slave could not refuse to render this service no matter how old he or she might be. If you were called upon to wash someone's feet, even if it was a banquet, even if there were many guests, you had to do it if you were called upon to do it, which meant getting onto the floor and washing their feet. Thomas says foot washing could be used as a synonym for slavery. To wash another's feet symbolized the subjugation of one person to another. And here we are tonight with Jesus our Lord subjecting himself to his disciples. It doesn't make sense, does it? Now, Pope Francis today went to a prison and he broke the rules because in the Catholic tradition they only wash the feet of men. The priest washes the feet of 12 men to symbolize the 12 apostles, disciples of Jesus. But today he went to a prison, Pope Francis, and washed the feet of 12 women inmates during the Holy Thursday service. He's 87 years old. He washed them from his wheelchair. And he washed them and he kissed them. And most of the women, they said, sobbed as he did it. Because they could not believe that someone, the Pope of Rome, the Pope of the church, was going to kiss and wash their feet because he wanted to show that he's the servant of all. Now, I have a foot washing bowl up here. A wedding present because you have to when you're a United Methodist pastor you get foot washing bowls as wedding presents. Got some water here. Some of you are looking scared now. Why are you looking scared? You don't get your feet washed, do you? Mm -hmm. Now some Protestant congregations have taken up washing hands instead of feet. Why is that, do you think? What? Up washing hands instead of feet. Let's say we're going to have a hand washing service Thursday night instead of a foot washing service. Why do you think that is? You don't wear sandals anymore. You gotta, if you have pantyhose on, you're in trouble if there's a foot washing, aren't you? Let's be real about this, right? But people don't like it. It's too intimate. I don't want anybody looking at my feet. I don't want anybody touching my feet. Ew, 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 ew. That's gross. I've heard that before. I had someone once say to me, because we did foot washing one of my congregations every Holy Thursday, she said, I'm not going to come if you still wash feet. I said, you don't have to participate. She said, I know, but I don't like seeing other people's naked feet up there. Naked feet? My golly Moses. Naked feet. I don't do a hand washing because I think there has to be something 
very intimate about washing someone's feet, hand washing. Boy, didn't that take on a new meaning during the COVID pandemic. I looked this up. I'm not going to tell you the whole thing, but between April 2020 and January 2022, the number of people who reported washing their hands with soap and water always or most of the time before preparing or eating food, preparing food, not just eating food, dropped from over 80% to below 60%, even though washing your hands is still one of the best ways to avoid food poisoning. And the number of participants who walked reported always washing their hands before, not before or after using the toilet, well, that declined even more. Now, Jesus said something about washing hands. Do you remember what he said? Because the Pharisees who were watching his disciples, they said, they don't wash their hands before they eat. What's wrong with them? That's our tradition, not a law, a tradition. Jesus says, it's not what goes into your body that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth. What goes into your mouth passes through your stomach and out into the sewer, he says. But what comes from you is what is in your heart, and that's what needs to be cleansed. Ha, 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 ha. About cleansing our inside, not our hands. Now, don't take this to me. I don't want you washing your hands, especially those of you who work in the kitchen. I want you washing your hands. Jesus is talking about a different kind of cleansing now. My first Lent here. Remember my first Lent? It was beautiful months before COVID hit. We were reading the book Amish Grace. We didn't get to finish it because we had to stop, because we stopped meeting in person. But Amish Grace talks about how you prepare yourself for communion. Does anyone finish that book and know how they prepare themselves for communion? They take it one time a year on this night or on this weekend before Easter. They have to forgive everyone in their community from their heart or nobody takes communion. They don't lie about that because they're Amish, for heaven's sakes. They don't know what lying is. And sometimes it takes them all day. Sometimes it takes several days. They'll come back again if they cannot forgive everyone from their heart. And you know what happens in an Amish community? If you get mad at your church, you don't go to the one down the road. You go back to your church and you make amends with the people that have wronged you, that you have wronged, and you forgive one another from your heart. That's how you prepare yourself for this meal. Because this meal is about being prepared for Jesus Christ to come into our lives again and again and again. So you know what really cleanses your heart? You know what this is really about tonight? It's the first line of the story we read tonight that Toby read to John from John. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. So communion and washing feet are acts of love. When I was in Frederick serving at Trinity United Methodist Church, one of my parishioners there, he's still my friend on Facebook, and he still occasionally comes into church to see me wherever I am. He's in his 30s now. He was six when this happened. His name is Kevin. He was born with spina bifida. He was paralyzed from the chest down and in a wheelchair. And he used to say, I just wish I could do a cartwheel one day. And I said, honey, I can't do a cartwheel. Never could. Even when I was young and thin, I couldn't do a cartwheel. So I understand the love of cartwheels. But we had a foot washing service. We had a grand service. We had a basketball court inside the church there. It was carpeted with the lines in the carpet. Nobody liked that, but the top, the way it was built. And we sat on the floor because that's how they had me at these little short tables like this with pillows and they'd lean, they'd recline. And we told people ahead of time that they could come and get their feet washed if they wanted to. No one had to participate. We had Jesus and the 12 disciples dressed in costumes. They sat in the middle and they acted out the story and then we all joined in and we shared communion with them and then we washed each other's feet. A woman had said to me, this is ridiculous. I don't want to come if you're going to wash feet. One of those, I don't want to look at anybody's naked feet types. She said, I don't want to do this. This is awful. I don't want to see all these feet. I'm not going to do it. She said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I said, well, you don't have to do it. You can just be there. Close your eyes, and we'll tell you when it's over. Well, Kevin, little Kevin, decided he wanted to get his feet washed. And he asked his mom, and his mom said, okay. And she pushed him up. And people just sort of spontaneously got up and washed each other's feet. 
He took his socks off. No one had ever seen his feet before. They were purple and black because he never walked. And someone went up and washed his feet. And he cried. Then he said, I want to wash somebody else's feet. And now bad everybody had been through the line already. And he held that bowl and he looked at the crowd and he said, Why don't you let me wash your feet? Please let me wash your feet. Guess who went up? She had to go to the bathroom and remove her pants to put her tights on to take them off under her pants. She came back, rolled up her pants legs. This was a lady who was about 60 years old laid down on the floor and put her feet on his lap and he washed her feet and he cried and she cried. And we chanted, which the other pastor said, they never chant here, and they chanted, Ubi Caritas at Amor, Ubi Caritas Deus CBS, which means where love and charity are found, there God is. God was in that room. God was in that room to the point that the guy who played Jesus went into the ministry. He said, I, I feel called now. He said, yeah, you can't exactly get nailed to a cross and not be called. And I feel love. It's all about love. This whole weekend is about love. Foot washing is an act of love. Passover is an act of love, even though it was a hard one because God did strike the firstborn of Egypt down. But God loved those people and led them to freedom through the sea, through the desert. Forty years they lived in the desert eating manna in the wilderness. It was an act of love. Holy communion is an act of love. It's the presence and power of Jesus Christ in our midst that we can taste, take into our bodies, and share with the world. Submitting to crucifixion was an act of love. Being raised from the dead, breaking the power of sin and death, that is an act of love. God's going to be with us always is an act of love. So how do we prepare for this holy meal? We confess our sins before God, before one another. And we forgive one another. I'm telling you the truth. If you haven't forgiven, if you have somebody in your heart you cannot forgive, then come forward and take communion, but make sure you take it, and with it you say to God, I will do my best to forgive. I will do my best to forgive because you have forgiven me so much. How could I withhold my forgiveness from anyone else, Lord? And God will transform you. God will free your heart. I'm telling you the truth. God will free you, make you whole, and let you live a new life that will be your act of love to your Savior. Holy Spirit can transform us. What did Jesus say? So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. We're not called to be doormats. They get your feet clean in a different way. By somebody wiping their stuff onto you. That's not what it's about. It's about willingly taking your place and washing someone's feet. So tonight, after we share in communion, if you feel like getting your feet washed, stick around. We've got some water. You don't have to do it, but if you want to, I would be happy to wash your feet. You'd have to sort of bear with me a little bit, because I'm going to do it from my, not wheelchair, but my rollator. But if Pope Francis can do this at 87, I'm a little bit younger than that, a little bit. Just a little bit. So let us join together now. And for